Hi everybody, welcome to our webinar. This afternoon or this morning we are covering archiving made easy, fast, efficient and seamless with Media Loopster and Archiware. Speaking, uh, this is David Fox from London uh, with Archiware. And with me today, I've got David Becker from Media Loopster. Hi, David. Hi, David. Hi. So um, let's uh, let's have a look at what we're going to be covering in today's webinar. Uh, before I do that, though, a uh, quick slide just to say that we would really like you to ask us some questions. We've put some time at the end of the webinar aside to run through any questions you ask. There's a questions box that you'll find in your uh, go to UI. So put the questions in there and we'll, we'll read them all out uh, uh, at the end of the webinar when we've covered all the content. So in this webinar today, um, we're going to give you an overview of Media Loopster. So we're looking at two different products today and how they combine. So one is the MAM system Media Loopster, which David's going to talk to us about. I'll then provide you with an overview of Archiware P5 for those in the audience that maybe already know about Media Loopster but don't yet know about P5. And then the important bit, how does Archiware and Media Loopster join up in an integration to give you even more than the, the sum of the two parts, if you like? And then at the end, we'll take those questions. So uh, let's kick off with some information from David about Media Loopster. So over to you, David. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm David Becker. I'm a senior product manager um, at Nachblau, so Nachblau is the company um, which does produce the, the MAM system Media Loopster. We're based in Hamburg, Germany. Um, so in a nutshell, Media Loopster is um, yeah, a MAM system so of professional management, media files and corresponding metadata. Um, also, we'll show you afterwards, um, also connecting with AI services. And um, it's very flexible and scalable solution. So it is used, um, our customers are starting from small production or post-production companies um, over medium-sized companies up to internationally operating media enterprises. Um, yeah, I will show you on the next slide. Um, so I'll tell you something about the, the key features. Um, so in this uh, case, it's, is one of the, the key features in terms of the architecture. Um, so Media Loopster is, um, yeah, like I said, it's platform independent, so it's based on Docker microservices, which means um, so the core system is running on a Linux system. Um, you can um, install it on premise, so most of the clients use Media Loopster on premise. Um, and because of the architecture and because of the scalability, um, you can, yeah, use it from your small company up to um, multi-site scenarios where you work with one media loop system in several locations and um, have all your content, all your storages, and all your metadata managed by one system. And um, Good question, and, David. As as yeah. it runs in Docker, does that mean somebody could run it in their own uh, cloud instance if they wanted to? Yeah, some uh, use it in their private cloud. So we always yeah like to be close to the main storage. So um, yeah, you, but uh, the architecture is yeah, it's it's ready to to run in a in a cloud scenario. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So on the next slide, um, we see. Um, yeah, some of the, the features regarding the workflows and the user interaction. So the user interface, it's a web browser interface. It's very easy to use. Uh, you don't need a lot of training to use Media Loopster or, and to use the full power of Media Loopster. We also can connect with AI engines for content analysis. So we have um, several engines, third party engines we're supporting as well as our own developments of AI engines, like a speech-to-text engine that's also running on-premise, um, so that you don't have to use um, third-party cloud-based engines. Um, MediaLibs has a panel integration with the Premiere Pro, so you uh, can work seamlessly with your favorite editing system. And um, of course, um, 
we uh, integrate uh, with RQRP5 using our archiving features. And last but not least, we're um, having a uh, offering a uh, open REST API to yeah make it very easy to integrate with other third-party systems and um, we also can import and export any kind of metadata in form of um, sidecar XML files so um, yeah this is okay. um, uh, another question in the uh, in the screen grabs on the screen there the darker one is this a native application for pulling um, files into Media Loopster? Um, now, this is a screenshot of the um, of our Adobe Premiere Pro plugin. So ah, it's yeah. it's built in the it's built in the um, Adobe Premiere interface, and this is why it looks um, has a kind of darker look and feel. Yeah, has a darker um, look. There's time at the end. I can show you also the the integration. Okay, excellent. And, I'll put you on the next slide. And on the next slide. Um, yeah, we see uh, what's possible uh, to to uh, when it comes to archiving of video assets. So with Media Loop, so we can um, control and kick off the, the whole archive and restore processes. So we're able to um, archive and restore yeah, selected assets or um, asset collections. Um, we're displaying the user um, if the high-risk content of your media is online or if it's in archive or if it's archived and it's both so it's um, online on your um, on your production storage um, you can do the whole archiving either manually or have it automated um, the configuration is also pretty easy because we have a system of connectors in media loopster in this administration interface um, where you can set up your archiving system so you can also attach to, to local archives, but um, also to, of course, to um, P5. And um, can schedule your archive um, processes. And um, also, if you're working closer or in, in, in integrated environments, um, you can also um, use the Media Loops API to control and to, to, yeah, to manage the archiving processes or just get the status of the archiving um, just by using the Media Loops um, API. Okay, got it. And the next slide takes us to the uh, the demo. So you're going to show us, um, you're going to show us your screen and give us a demo. So I'm just handing over the presenter right. button to you, David. Okay, now I'm um, sharing my screen, and what we see now is the main interface of Media Loopster in the web browser. So um, my demo system here is all pre-configured. Um, I have um, some content imported, and I am logged in as a user. So we have um, several users you can use. Um, to log into the system. Everything we see here in the user interface is um, based on user or group permissions. So if a user has less permissions, you just see um, not as many buttons and menu items as I see now. Um, we can um, browse our content by um, just clicking on the items here on the uh, left-hand side which is the search area in Media Loopster. So I can perform a search here by using this, for example, this simple search field here. Um, you can click on any asset and get an instant preview in the media player. Um, in this media player, you um, have a time accurate and, um, yeah, time code accurate, um, frame accurate um, playback of the video. So you see exactly the time code of your high-risk content. We have some basic asset-based metadata here underneath the player. And on the right-hand side, we have also kind of um, um, a list of your metadata that's inside the video file. So we are able to segment the video into several shots and attach almost any kind of metadata to these single shots. So this is very helpful if it comes to metadata that's created by AI content analysis engines. 
So we can um, attach, for example, to um, Azure Video um, Analyzer or um, AWS Recognition to um, create or to, to use automated keyword uh, creation and have your content tagged by these um, engines. David, do a lot of your customers use the AI uh, keyword tagging uh, gen with, in their workflows? Is that a big thing these days already? Um, yes, more and more customers um, using it. Um, so almost all the new customers, um, they, they ask for it and um, they're using it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's this really increasing demand of, um, uh, of these AI services. And what we also do is that we um, can create transcripts of your video. Like in this case, um, there has been a transcription um, has been made by our uh, own um, ASR engine, which runs on premise. So there's also an option, Media Loop, so that um, we can ship kind of um, appliance um, and you can do all your um, speech to text um, performance um, you can do it all on premise so you're not have to open your system um, to public cloud services and it's all your data and you can have kind of unlimited um, processing time to uh, produce the um, the transcripts of the video so in this case we have the full transcript here if we have um, information about the speaker, we also can um, tag the speaker. Um, we instantly create um, subtitles of the video. We can yeah, display the subtitles here. And if there's any alteration to make in the, um, in the transcript, I also can use the um, editing feature. So I can um, edit the transcript, save the transcript here, and um, yeah, I'm good to go. And of course, I can use the transcript to search my content. I can perform searches based on what's um, what's being said in my uh, in my content. So um, yeah, this is basically um, the search and, and metadata functionality. Um, if I want to um, store my search results, I can easily just um, make a, some kind of personal content collection by just drag and drop my content to this, um, yeah, to this favorite list here. Mm -hmm. And I am able to, um, yeah, take this content um, and to hand it over to um, additional workflows like, yeah, sending it somewhere, um, editing it, so I have an integrated rough cut editor to mm -hmm. um, also do based on the video proxies, do some editing here, and um, I can also hand it over to Adobe Premiere. When you do that, by default, the, your Premiere will be using the proxies, so the proxies that Media Loops are generated from the high res content will be passed into the uh, um, non-linear editor to uh, to edit, and then you. Uh, pull in the high res when the project is ready for export and to, um, there's a word for that that I forget, uh, conform. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is something that's uh, new uh, with Media Loopster and with the Media Loopster uh, Premiere Pro panel integration. We have here this checkbox, say use proxies. And if I check this checkbox, then Media Loopster uses the proxies from, um, uh, from, um, that we already created to yeah. do the editing. And then you can, at the end, you can do your final conform when you're exporting, doing kind of, uh, we call it a remote export. So mm -hmm. you can, um, yeah, you can choose a, uh, a remote export preset and then the rendering uh, takes place in a remote location or not in mm -hmm. a remote location, but um, in on-premise where the renderer has um, access to your high-risk media. Yeah. So if you were going to build a cloud-based uh, workflow, you might just put proxies in the cloud and then keep the high res on-prem for um, putting um, back into the project at the end. Yeah, you could do it like that. So um, you can set up Media Loop so that, um, so it's up to you where the, uh, where the proxies are stored. 
So um, it's it can be done by configuration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. All right. So far, um, yeah, this just was brief overview. Of course, there's much more possible, but um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we'll have a look at it. Uh, we'll we'll switch back to you in a in a couple of minutes when we're actually looking at the right. uh, the, the archive integration. So I'm going to come back to uh, to my side just briefly. Uh, so that was a live demo of Media Loopster, and now we're going to look at ArchiWare P5. So I'm going to give a, a simple overview for those that are not familiar with ArchiWare, which is a, a suite of products which we'll talk about. So we're a, a German product. We're from Munich, uh, over 20 years uh, heritage in data management, and then uh, with a specific focus around media and entertainment. And we have many thousands of P5 licenses sold throughout the world. The product breaks down into three uh, pieces. Let me see if I can just get my highlighter. So we have three modules. So the one that we're focused around today is in the middle. This is the P5 archive. P5 archive is all about moving uh, data. In the case of uh, Media Loops, so this is likely to be video footage. We're going to be able to move this from the primary storage, the production storage, to cold storage, which is cheaper long term storage. Uh, creating free space on the production storage. And the intention with archiving is generally that you want to keep it forever. So a typical archive workflow is a project is completed. It's using a lot of space from production storage, primary storage. So you archive it somewhere safe, safer than hard drives in terms of longevity. And then you keep it forever because you don't know when you might need that in the future. You might need it in a year, but it might be still useful to have it in 10 years. P5 Archive is able to archive to either tape or cloud storage. Uh, and generally speaking, it's useful for in terms of backup, which we'll talk about because it reduces the amount of data that you have to back up. And then over here on the left hand side, speaking of backup, we also have a backup module, which will allow you also to use, use your cloud storage or your tape LTO storage to make a copy of your important data for disaster recovery purposes. So if you have a disaster, like uh, you know damage to the building, damage to hardware, and you need to restore your data back onto your storage, then this is what the backup is for. Uh, and the backup typically doesn't keep the data forever, or it shouldn't ever keep data forever. This is the task for the archive. The backup is there to protect the storage, the archive is there to keep stuff into the future that uh, doesn't need to be on that storage. And then over on the right hand side, we have a third module, which is a, a, a disk to disk cloning of files and folders across the network between two hosts. This gives you the ability to make a clone of your important storage with immediate access to that storage if you have a, a failure of the main storage. So it's not writing to cloud or LTO tape, it's copying from disk to disk. So within this, uh, I just wanted to drive home that backup and archive are different. You should not be using your archive as a backup because the archive is there for a different, uh, the backup is there for a different purpose. It's there to copy data for disaster recovery, whereas archive is moving data into the archive to keep it for the long term. So I think at this point, you're probably quite clear that we have this distinction between backup and archive. And we deal with this through two separate products that you can use together, potentially with the same LTO storage. And media and bro broadcast companies, they all need an archive. If they didn't realize it yet, then they're going to realize it at some point, because they're all generating media files, large files, and you can't just keep throwing those onto cheap USB drives uh, with the expectation that they're going to they're gonna work in 10 years' time. Um, but, you know, they're not redundant, which is something that you can achieve with cloud and LTO storage. They're probably not off site or certainly not that easy to keep off site when you want to access them quickly. You can't search and figure out what uh, what project is on what hard drive. You, you know, you end up with a spreadsheet or something. So as an archive vendor, we see a lot of customers coming to us with the pile of USB hard drives on shelves. Uh, and, you know, we have a better solution, a professional solution that you can replace this with and migrate to. So where does, uh, so ArcuFP5 is software, so you can choose where you want to run it. Uh, you can run on Windows, Mac, Linux, um, FreeBSD, Solaris, 
Uh, we also have uh, installers to run directly from the stores on QNAP and Synology and so on. Uh, if you were looking to run with uh, Media Loopster, then you can choose what operating system, what kind of host you want to put the ArchiWare software on. Obviously, part of that decision will be around the kind of storage that you want to write to. If you want to be writing out to tape, then you'll need a physical host and you'll need to have a SAS card or, or a Thunderbolt interface to get to that tape storage. Uh, all the products install with a single installer uh, and um, the license determines what uh, which modules are activated. And then a big part of the ArchiWare ecosystem is that we plug into many MAM products, including Media Loopster. And we do this because we're providing the archive back end, very often used with LTO tape. So a MAM system doesn't want to integrate and write drivers for LTOs. It's a difficult, complicated thing to do. And ArchiWare already did this. So if you plug into ArchiWare, you get all the benefit of being able to, to write to LTO tape. ArchiWare has a solutions page here where you'll find uh, details about all of the other vendors that we have integrations with, in addition to Media Loopster. Uh, when you're using LTO uh, storage with P5, then you can scale from a single tabletop LTO drive, a standalone drive, which you can buy for you know a few thousand uh, dollars. You could have maybe multiple standalone drives if you want to have some redundant writing going on. And then after that, you'd be looking at scaling up to a small, medium, large LTO library, which needs a rack in a server room to accommodate it, probably cooling and so on. But this allows you to have 25, 50, 80, 200 tapes in a single device and the capacity of a single tape multiplied by many tapes in the single library means that you can have a big online archive uh, with lots of LTO tapes. And ArchiWare will manage all of these tapes. It knows where every file is that you archive through Media Loopster. So when you go into Media Loopster and you have a tape library and you want to restore a project, then we load the right tape. We know where everything is stored because we index everything. Uh, LTO, this is not my uh, graphic, but this is the LTO roadmap from QSTAR. And you can see here that we, uh, we're currently on the LTO 9 generation, which gives you 18 terabytes of uncompressed capacity per tape. LTO 8 is also in, in use at the moment commonly with 12 terabytes. So the tape capacity is quite high. And then LTO 10, which will be announced soon, we hope, uh, may have up to 36 terabytes of capacity per tape. And a single tape is around $100 currently. So you get a lot of terabytes for your dollar with LTO, plus the advantage that the tapes are very stable for long-term retention of data. So if you're keeping your data on tape, then it's much safer than it would be on a hard drive, which doesn't have a very long lifespan by comparison. Alternatively, you might want to use uh, one of the public cloud vendors for your archives uh, uh, um, storage, which again is we support all of the main cloud vendors, and you can set up the workflow to go to cloud with Media Loopster, exactly how you do it with tape. It's just a different endpoint that we're writing to. Or you can have both. So you might want to have some on-premise tapes, but you might also want to put a copy in AWS Glacier Deep Archive storage for certain data so that you have belt and braces, so that you have that insurance policy copy in the cloud. So on this uh, graphic, I'm just showing you a little bit of the native P5. Uh, we have a very simple MAM style interface for everything that you archived. So if you're using us through Media Loopster, you don't need to interact with this uh, screenshot specifically. But if you want to use P5 in isolation, then we track every file. So here we're in a particular folder uh, in this source folder. I can see all these AVI media files in this folder. This is stuff that was archived and is no longer on disk, right? This is an index encapsulating what was on the disk but is now on tape. Then we can see thumbnails of these media files. I can even have P5 store its own small proxy so that I can get a little bit of playback of a media file that has been committed to tape, including metadata, custom metadata that I can see about that file. And this whole interface is there so that we can search, browse, and find things that we want to recover from the archive and pull it back onto, onto disk storage. So P5 has its own web interface, 
but when you're using it with a, an API and a product like Media Loopster, then you really just, just need to use the web interface to get everything set up and configured. And once that's done, all of the interaction with the archive will happen through Media Loopster. So with that, um, we're going to switch back to you, David, because you're going to show us the um, the integration actually uh, happening. So I just got to get the right bit of the UI and make you the presenter again. There we go. So yeah, here we go. So yeah, um, this is the P5 interface that like we saw in the uh, in the slide before. Um, on the systems, a instance of P5 running, which is already configured. So I've set up all my uh, my library, my um, archive plan, and this is all the information I need to do the configuration in Media Loopster. So I need some some information um, of my um, of my current setup here in um, P5, um, and then I am able to um, yeah to configure and to to add. Um, an archive connector in the Media Loopster administration interface. So I already added an archive connector for ArcAware P5, uh, which uh, stores all the, the configuration data to um, make the integration happen. So um, what can we do um, in Media Loopster with the assets that should be archived? Um, as I mentioned before, this could be done automatically or manually. I will show you the manual way because it's um, easier to um, easier to understand um, what's happening. So I can um, click on an asset, um, and here I can see the status of my media, which is currently it's ready for production. Which means the high risk content is stored on my um, production storage. It's not in the archive, and it's um, yeah approved by um, the um, the editor. So I can, yeah, just first of the first place, I will open up the job monitor in Arcuware because we want to see what's happening in P5. Just arrange my window here a bit. So um, yeah, if I do want to send some assets to the archive, I just simply click to send uh, on to click on send to archive. Um, I have also a monitoring interface in Media Loopster where I can um, monitor what's going on um, with the archiving. Now I see it's archiving here in the um, P5 interface. See also the job is going to be archived. Um, and it's done because it's uh, yeah really fast, or especially in this scenario. Of course, the speed I think depends on the, for the purposes of the demo. You're using disk storage rather than like a, a yeah. LTO storage. Otherwise, we would be waiting a little yeah. while while the software is saying, "Yeah, we're loading the tape and we're winding the tape and so on." Yeah. Um, yeah. So in the media loop interface, it says, "Okay, it's it's archived." Um, and if I look into the um, main user interface here in Media Loopster. I can see now that my asset is um, kind of displayed like so kind of faded out, um, which means that uh, in our configuration here, the high-risk file of the asset got um, immediately removed from our production storage um, in the second um, when the asset was successfully archived by P5. Mm -hmm. So we have now um, this label also here, it's stored in the archive. And um, yeah, I can do everything else in Media Loopster um, in terms of working with the asset. So I can use the proxy file, of course. I can use the rough cut editing. I can also use the proxy editing in Adobe Premiere. I can um, edit my metadata, use my metadata, export my metadata. So um, it's very, very easy to use. And of course, I can automate it and um, let yeah, the automation do all the archiving process. 
Do some of your customers, David, do they um, do they archive that once they've got all of the proxies generated and all of the footage inside of Media Loopster for a project, do they so sometimes take the original high res into an archive just to give them space back because they don't need well, everything um, of high res on on the server until they have an edit and they want to um, pull yeah. everything together for the edit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, many do this because um, it's it's very expensive, editing storage, this high speed storage, and um, mm. to save, yeah, to save money and to save storage space, um, most of the content uh, we have some customers where most of the content is stored in the archive and is only restored for um, editing. Yes, yes, um, yes. I should point out actually that when when you're restoring a uh, high res back with uh, media files back with Archiware from the archive, we don't just restore the, the we don't we don't just restore a sub clip that you created from the original footage. We always pull the entire uh, media file back in its entirety. So we're a file based workflow, and we don't repackage a sub clip from a from an original high res file and just give you that. Uh, that's that's something that the MAM system will do. Yeah, and um, yeah, and the um, the restore process is yeah as easy as the archiving. I can simply just um, click on restore from archive, and um, then it gets into the re restore queue, and mm -hmm. yeah, it takes just an instance to um, to restore the file, um, especially when it's disk based, um, but also um, on a tape in a tape based workflow, it's pretty fast. Um, yeah. If the tape is once loaded. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I should just add if anybody's yeah, this... got any questions that are recurring to them right now, see some questions coming in, then please type questions in now so that you're ready for us to answer them in the QA session. Yeah, so we had a restore job that we saw running in our job monitor window there. Um, the um, job yeah. monitor window is a really useful part of P5, I should mention, because you can see here what jobs are running in p5 and a job is really either writing to tapes or reading from tapes or preparing fresh tapes for writing so you can see what everybody is running on the system from the restore window uh, from the job monitor window yeah and this um just to mention that this uh these archiving restore actions are of course even if I do it manually, I'm not only working for single assets, I can also use my um, my favorites list so I can uh, drag all the content I want to archive into my um, yeah into my favorites list or I can use um, a thing called we call, um, a thing we call collections like asset collections. I have a full project and I want to restore and archive everything that's used in this project, so this could be yeah a couple of terabytes data, um, all kinds of data that I want to keep together uh, when I want to, uh, when I um, archive and I restore the content. So of course I can just yeah, kick off the um, archiving process by um, yeah, sending the list content to the archive and then archiving um, everything that's inside this mm -hmm. list or inside this, uh, this collection. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, okay. Well, thanks we... for thanks for showing us. So um, I'll come back to my uh, slide deck here, and then we'll proceed with uh, looking at some questions that you've asked us. Um, Archiware, just to give you a couple of URLs, we'll share the slide deck with everybody that registered. Um, Archiware uh, have their latest version of the software and the ability to get a five or thirty day trial evaluation license via the website. So if anybody wants to check Archiware out, they can install it on their Mac, on their Windows host, on their QNAP, Synology, etc. License it and have a play with it. We've got lots of uh, videos on YouTube where you may be watching this that will show you how to set up a simple workflow. And then Media Loopster can be found at medialoopster.com. So with that, let's go and see if you're asking us anything. So 
uh, taking these in order, Michael says, uh, what kind of storage hardware is underneath? So I guess that's one for your demo and the way that that was set up, David. Um, yeah, um, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so Media Loopster, we can ship Media Loopster as software only or with an hardware, um, uh, with a hardware appliance. So if it's software only or in general, um, because it's Linux based, we can work with almost any storage that uh, can be mounted under Linux. So um, it's storage agnostic. We can yeah use almost any kind of um, editing storage. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. So the storage has to be mountable into where Media Loopster is running in a Linux uh, Docker uh, uh, container. Yeah. So you have to have the storage visible to Docker. But I think uh, I can't think of many pieces of storage that you can't mount into a Linux operating system. So yeah, answer there, Michael, is that it's really agnostic. Um, and uh, there's not any specific uh, storage that you have to worry about. Um, Load asks, how does Media Loops to manage vertical and square video files? That's an interesting question. Can you cope with um, any as aspect ratios, non-standard? Um, yeah, we do. So in um, we handle almost any kind of um, aspect ratio in our, we can display them in our player um at the moment it's that if it's um a kind of upright video then we have kind of pillar box or um or letter box but it's uh, always displayed in the uh, in the right aspect ratio in the original aspect ratio yeah because a lot of video is going portrait uh, for social media these, these days isn't it so that's a big big change uh same question from load uh not the same question another question from the same person is there a transcoder possibility in different format and sizes? So I guess that's talking about the transcoding that happens in Media Loopster. I guess you can configure that, right, to be what, whatever is the customer needs. Um, yeah, we um, do have internal transcoding in the first place to create our um, proxies. So everything we're importing, we're creating a proxies for to make it yeah, visible and playable in the web browser. Yeah. Um, and um, to some extent, we can also use this transcoder to um, to export content. But um, so if you're exporting content using our uh, internal transcoder, you're more or less free to, to choose your own um, formats. If it mm -hmm. comes to the video proxy, it's, um, it's a kind of fixed format um, where um, within the next versions, we will, um, yeah, we will do a kind of um, feature that we're creating more than one version of the proxies to make it, um, yeah, to, to have a variety of, of in, 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 in video quality. Mm. But in the, mm. at the moment, it's, it's a kind of fixed format. Okay. That's good to know. Uh, let's just remove that question. Um, I've got a question from Samir asking, how long does it take to configure the P5 integration in Media Loopster? Does that take long if, if you've already got your P5 set up? Um, it does take a couple of minutes because it's, um, it's very easy to, if you have all your, your data ready, uh, your archive plan or the, the connection data, then it's very mm -hmm. easy. And um, then you, you can assign in Media Loopster um, to which yeah, to which parts of the uh, yeah, to which parts of the systems um, this archiving uh, configuration should apply. Okay, yeah, because within P5 you typically set up an archive plan, which is a workflow which knows which storage to write to and which place to index what what is being archived, and then that plan is usually just selected within Media Loopster um, uh, along with the IP and login details of the host, and that's typically all that's needed to to link up the two systems. Uh, a couple of questions from Tim. Hi, Tim. Uh, let me just expand this so I can read it. Uh, so Tim asks, you showed how media that, ha that has been archived can be deleted immediately from live or working storage. Is it possible to give archived media a time to live on the working storage or have it deleted once some other action has been completed? So I guess Tim's asking, yes, you can have media deleted immediately upon archive but could you leave it on the storage for some period afterwards or have some other thing trigger the deleting so one for you david 
Um, yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can um, set up a kind of default time. How uh, how long should content stay by default in your system? And this also applies to to the archiving. And um, if you're working with the content collections, we also take mm -hmm. into account if we have um, do we have content that is um, still used in the project, um, then we don't uh, delete the high risk content immediately. So there are um, many parameters that you can configure. Um, yeah. um, so you can make sure that your content doesn't disappear before you want it to disappear. Or you wanted it to. Okay, good. And uh, another question from Tim, can you use import, can you use import or use proxy files created by other systems or MAMs? So if there are already proxies uh, existing, can you pull in high res and proxy together? Um, yes, you can. It's not the it's not the default uh, production scenario, but um, in many cases we have um, migration. If we we start to use Media Loopster um, with the customer, um, in most of the cases we can have some kind of migration scenario, and um, within this migration scenario we can also use. Um, proxies that have been already created by um, other systems to, yeah, to, to to start working with Media Loops or, or if most of the content is um, already archived, then we can use the proxies without um, using the high res content to set up Media Loops. Okay, uh, we're now a little bit over time, so we'll just do one more question, which is from Jonathan. He asks, is it possible to have more than one copy of your archive data? e.g. separate destinations such as LTO and cloud at the same time? Very good question. Um, if you want to have two copies on tape and you have two LTO drives, then we have a workflow called cloning, which will achieve two copies across two tapes using two drives simultaneously. If you want to have something a bit different, like maybe if you only have one LTO drive or you have uh, a desire for LTO and cloud, then you can set up two separate workflows. First one, maybe that writes to your A set of tapes, and the second one writes to your B set of tapes. So you have independent workflows. You have to run the job twice, but you're going to achieve the same thing. You're going to have redundancy across storage. Or you could be running the first job writing to LTO, second job writing to cloud storage. And uh, yeah, so currently, that's how you would work, uh, but Arcuware are always uh, revising and updating the product, so expect to see some additional functionality here uh, in future releases, because this is something that Arcuware is very focused on. Okay, so um, thank you. Uh, you're welcome to everybody that's typing in nice um, things regards to the content. Uh, so thanks ever so much, David. I think we did a really good job there at communicating what we have together, what we have separately, etc. So brilliant that you had time to come together with us to do this. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, and we'll see you all in the next webinar. Bye for now.